Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad you have come along. Look, this is an episode I have been waiting for. I'm so excited that finally I have Robert Gagnon, Dr. Robert Gagnon on the podcast. And I'm going to introduce him in just a second. And many of you have said, uh, I've said this, I've, the podcast has been going three or four years. People say, oh, you really need to get Robert Gagnon. I said, I know, I know. But finally, this year, I've gotten to know him a little bit, and it's made it a little easier for me to be in touch with him and, and make the request. But before we get to that, I want to make sure you know this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we sense there are churches all over the world who are looking for a trusted leader who's going to come in and deliver the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And that means that we teach within the perspective of the authority of scripture and the reality and promise of the sanctified life that we can experience sanctifying grace in this life. And we're excited too at WBS that the Global Methodist Church has named us as an approved institution, but also we're the first institution approved to offer a course of study for people in the Global Methodist Church. And just in the last two months, we've added more than 150 students. Can you believe that? That's put a lot of work on me uh, as an academic dean. But nevertheless, we're really thrilled to be able to serve the church in this way. And so if you're interested in learning more about our uh, course of study program with the Global Methodist Church, you can check that out at wbs.edu or any of our programs from our lay initiatives, bachelor's, master's, master's divinity, and doctor of ministry degree. We'd love to talk to you more about that. Also, this podcast is brought to you by William Roberts, who is a financial planner who does a great job helping people, particularly those who are in ministry, think through planning for their retirement. It's not necessarily something we cover in seminary, but it is something that's important for you to think about. And he does a great job helping people with that. Finally, if you're interested in the things that are coming from this podcast, the More to the Story podcast, I have an email list and I would love for you to sign up for that. And if you do, I will send you a free gift. And that is a, a tool called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching. It's a 45 minute teaching session and an eight page document that really helps people go deeper into scripture using an inductive method with the aim too of keeping the homiletical task in mind along the way. So I'd love for you to check that out. I also have a six week session, a six week series uh, for small groups on the book of Jude, which covers a lot of the, the content that we're gonna talk about today. It's called Contender. You can find out all about all that stuff at andymillerthe3rd.com. That's andymillerii.com. All right. I am thrilled to welcome to the podcast, Dr. Robert Gagnon. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. It's a pleasure to be on. Well, and, and Dr. Gagnon teaches at um, Houston Christian University, formerly Houston Baptist University, and uh, has taught as He's been an academic for years, and he has written the definitive volume, in my view, on human sexuality from a biblical interpreter's perspective um, called The Bible and Homosexual Practice. I have it here. Unfortunately, I don't have a good cover. You can only see the side. Um, but just to give you an idea for the, the nature of the standard that Dr. Gagnon writes at and, and the way that it's respected in the field, I just want to read to you the names of the people who have endorsed his book, James Barr. Brevard Child. Um, let's see, I'll just keep going through. C.E.B. Cranfield, I. Howard Marshall, Douglas Moo, James D.G. Dunn, C.K. Barrett. That's some high praise there, Dr. Gagnon. Yes, I was blessed by that. I didn't know what I could expect from producing a book like that. And right. uh, in fact, especially among some persons who uh, have a different perspective on the issue, um, like James Barr. Um, right, like Mark right. Nissen and, and others. So, yeah, it was amazing to me. Uh, uh, another ethicist I'm blanking on from Oxford, uh, that they were actually able to to give me good endorsements for the book. So praise God. Yeah. And, and I think this is one thing that's been interesting to me is that if people are going to write in any academic way about human sexuality and if they don't address your book, it's almost to me, I feel like they're not being a, a good academic. They're not doing a thorough job because you've presented a case. And if they're going to have a different view, they're going to have to refer to you. And, and just the fact that those names are ones who have endorsed your book and said this is solid scholarship. So it's really, I want to say like at the start of this, I have a very specific question I want to ask you, but uh, thank you for this volume. I know that it's probably come at a very uh, high personal cost to you as well to write such a strong, thorough volume, but it's really a blessing to the church. Thank you, Andy. 
So why I wanted to bring you in today is you wrote a great article that uses some of your past research, and this was on the Christ Overall website, and the title is this, Is It Loving for a Faithful Christian to Go to a Gay Wedding? I love that you wrote on this because this is a pressing question that many people have in our day, and in you Start this article by thinking about rather or not this is what you call a, a Romans 14 question. What do you mean by that? What's a Romans 14 question? Well, there are a lot of people in the evangelical world who now support or at least allow for attendance at a gay wedding. Yeah. Uh, Timothy Dalrymple, CEO of Christianity Today. Um, yeah. Focus on the family. I'm stunned. Uh, to see that focus in the family called this a Romans 14 issue, an agree to disagree issue in terms of attending a gay wedding. Preston Sprinkle, who's been very prominent recently on, right, right. on uh, as a New Testament scholar dealing with issues on homosexuality and transgenderism, uh, recommends it, actually, if your child identifies as gay and gets married to a person of the same sex, that you should attend that wedding. Um, of course, Andy Stanley has already gone over. Uh, he's yes, been going yeah. over to the left on this issue of sexual ethics for over a decade now. And we'll be having a conference in September, hosting it in his church using a stealth homosexual front organization called Embracing the Journey and having speakers like Justin Lee uh, wow. and uh, David Gushy, who are thoroughly supportive of homosexual unions. Uh, Justin Lee is still looking for Mr. Wright. And they all they all adopt this at if they're not actually thoroughly supporting gay unions, they are at least uh, affirming of attending gay weddings. Right. And as I said, they all use the Romans 14 analogy. If they're evangelicals, they still want to maintain a veneer for being opposed to homosexual practice um, as not a flourishing event. They nonetheless will say, but attending a gay wedding is okay because of Romans 14. Now, Romans 14 is an issue about diet and calendar. Right, right. Paul is dealing with in Rome. They're strong. Uh, those who have no scruples over eating, they eat all foods, treat all foods alike. Um, and then the weak who have scruples against eating meat, which is not specifically forbidden in Judaism, but it's sort of like a hyper demonstration of fidelity to food laws, and to the law in general. And uh, it, it, Paul argues that it's basically a matter of indifference. Right. He agrees with the strong that you can eat all things, but he says, look, whether you eat meat or don't eat meat, this is not what the kingdom of God consists of. The kingdom of God consists of righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. This is not such a matter. It is therefore a matter of indifference. It is up to each individual to decide for themselves whether they should engage in the practice of eating meat or not, and uh, basically mind your own business to both sides, wow. even though I basically agree with the strong. Now, so when you're saying that attending a gay wedding is a Romans 14 issue, you're saying it's a matter of ethical indifference. It doesn't matter. You can right. go, not go, as you see fit. There's no moral question really involved in the going, as long as you don't uh, overtly say that you support um, homosexual activity. And that's where they are completely wrong. There yeah. is no uh, Christian in the first century, no positive protagonist of the faith, including our Lord and the apostolic witness to him, that would possibly endorse the attendance at a gay wedding. Okay, let me stop you there. That's really good. I mean, this is very helpful like to make this piece. And one of the things that happens is the, the nature of how we uh, uh, go to scripture or use scripture as an analogy for other issues that are contemporary issues. But one of the things I know that you're asked a lot about is, well, did Jesus really address this? Did Jesus really address same-sex behavior or same-sex marriage? Um, and I know that that's a, a question you get regularly, but I mean, many people just suggest, well, this can't, you know, there's just the, the so-called clobber passages, these type of things. They're, they're, it, it's not that big of an issue. That's why we just need to put make it a Romans 14 issue. I mean, did Jesus address this, Dr. Gagnon? Uh, Jesus did not address homosexual practice in the same way that he did not address incest. Yes. Right. 
he agreed with the standard that overwhelming witness of his scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, what they would have referred to simply as the Bible, uh, the scriptures. Uh, it, it, the witness is absolutely clear. We do know that Jesus did address the question of sexual ethics with regard to divorce and remarriage and implicitly with regard to polygamy. Right. And there he sets up a standard for sexual ethics. And the very foundation for Jesus' entire position on sexual ethics, he locates in one third of Genesis 127, male and female, he made them. Right. Now, extraordinary. Why even why even bring up that verse? I, 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 you know, I've never really heard a good explanation from those on the other side who think that Jesus didn't care about the issue of homosexual practice. There are really two ways of looking at homosexual practice. One is a direct way, which involves a prohibition. You shall a man shall not have sex with a male as though uh, shall not lie with a male as though lying with a woman. Uh, that is for sexual purposes. That's one way. Another way is more indirect, but even more profound. And that's simply reaffirming a male-female requirement for sexual ethics. So if I say that the very foundation of sexual ethics is that God intentionally designed two complementary sexes, sexes that are counterparts to each other, male and female, that he intentionally designed that as the very foundation of all sexual ethics, as a basic requirement for everything that goes forward, then obviously, by definition, homosexual practice is precluded, right? Because right. then the only form of homosexual practice that could be accepted was one uh, that would involve sexual counterparts, male and female. In other words, no form of homosexual practice, because right. if it involves male and female, by definition, it isn't homosexual. So that for Jesus was absolutely central. And it's the it's God's deliberate creation of a sexual binary that Jesus used to establish a principle about number. Right. The number of persons allowable in a sexual union, whether at any one time, no polygamy, or whether serially, a uh, revolving door of divorce and remarriage for any cause. Jesus rejected those two dimensions of sexual immorality on the basis of the two-ness of the sexes that are anatomically, physiologically, even psychologically, each other's sexual counterpart or complement. So that when you bring together a man and a woman, a male and a female, the only two sexes that God intentionally designed, then you create a sexual whole, right? Yes, the two yes. halves of the sexual spectrum unite to form a single whole, a third party then, uh, whether concurrent or serial, is neither necessary nor desirable, because you've already brought together a holistic sexual union. So while Jesus didn't explicitly mention homosexual practice, because it would have been absurd for him to do so, given right. the fact that no Jew in early first century Palestine, or within centuries before or after that time period in Palestine, was advocating for homosexual practice, let alone doing it. There's simply no reason for Jesus to spend any time on that. Um, how many times have you heard, Andy, in a sermon, or have you ever given a sermon, uh -oh. where you made clear that sex between a person and his or her parents is immoral? Have you ever heard <laughs> a sermon, whole sermon on that subject? I have not. I have not offered that sermon yet, but I'll take the challenge if you want. Well, <laughs> I'm really concerned about you, Andy, because yeah. what that tells me about you is you do not think uh, parent child incest is a problem <laughs> because you've never yeah. really devoted a sermon to it. You must. Right. You must have. I can only conclude some secret acceptance for incest. Is this true, Andy? <laughs> you got me. You got me. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. That is not the case. I just want to be clear. And somebody <laughs> takes that. <laughs> Let us establish that Andy is not for incest. Okay, good. Not even for an adult consensual union, right? Oh, man. The, the, of course, that's the interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. That's, so, so obviously, I, 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 we're being facetious here. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was listening to us. Clearly, my point here is sometimes infrequency of mention is an indicator of the severity of the offense. Wow. 
Wow. Right? right? Yeah. Because you don't want to scandalize the church and especially young people. Even talking about it, even in a way rejecting it, to some extent contributes to normalizing it. So yeah. you don't do it unless there's a crisis in the culture over accepting it. So Jesus is not going to address homosexual practice in the context of early first century Judaism in Palestine, where nobody is questioning it, everybody accepts it, and there's no record of anybody doing it within centuries before and after the life of Jesus. It's simply not appropriate. It's, a, it's an alarming, scandalizing thing right from the very beginning. That's why we don't talk about even incest now, because the very mention of man-mother incest or daughter father incest is wow that is shocking do you not yeah. realize who's in the congregation here you don't realize that just even in prohibiting it you're already putting the idea in somebody said so that's why jesus doesn't address it directly instead he deals with the very foundation of sexual ethics in genesis 1 that establishes the impossibility of any homosexual unions that means all homosexual unions for jesus are an assault on the very foundation of creation that establishes the basis for sexual ethic principles, which Jesus can then extrapolate secondarily from that foundation. Take incest that we just mentioned. Why is incest wrong? Someday yeah. go to a cocktail party, Andy, and just throw out that question. You know, why not have sex with your parents? <laughs> and do that yeah. at an event at Wesley Biblical Seminary. I am sure, I, don't, <laughs> I can't say I've witnessed the event, I am sure that you will stop conversation cold. Yeah, Everyone yeah. will be looking at Andy. <laughs> oh, my goodness, Andy. And uh, and the reason for that is, wow, you know, people will be shocked. It'll be hard for them to initially to explain why. The initial explanation that they're going to give is because it's your parent. Right, right, right. right. You know, it should be obvious to you if I have to explain to you why incest is wrong, an irreducible minimum of sexual ethics, then Houston, um, Nick picking out the space program, we yeah. have a problem, right? Yes. Because everybody should be able to intuit. But that's also a reason why it's hard to give a good rational explanation for why incest is wrong. Do you know that in Leviticus 18, where it introduces the issues of incest uh, and then other sexual ethic concerns, Starting in Leviticus 18.6, it actually gives us the implicit reason why incest mm. is wrong. You shall not have sex with the flesh of your own flesh. Mm. Somebody who is too, in, this, in terms of structural organization of who you are, right, right, your right. bodies, you, you are already too much that person with right, whom right. you want to have sex with. Too much of the same, not enough complementary otherness. We would say scientifically today, not enough differentiation in the gene right. pool, right? There's got to be a kinship otherness in right. And so if that's what's wrong with incest, too much formal embodied identity with the individual with whom you're having sex, not enough complementary otherness, why would homosexual practice be wrong? Yeah. Too much identity. The same thing. Here, yep. here on a level even more important for sex than kinship, which is namely sex itself. Yes. Gender itself. Right. And so it, it's it's clear on that basis. Why is incest wrong? Incest is extrapolated as wrong based on a principle already ensconced in Genesis 1-2 as to why homosexual practice is wrong. Homosexual practice is wrong because God created two sexual counterparts or complements that moderate each other's, each other's extremes and fill in the gaps of an individual sex. Right. Same sex union, you're being erotically aroused by all, what you already essentially are, mm. anatomically, physiologically, and psychologically, as though you were not, right. or as though you were only half your own sex. So there is, again, it establishes the principle that sexual unions involves intercourse between embodied complements or counterparts. And it's like on that basis that we can extrapolate a principle that incest is wrong. 
because there's too much identity here now, not on the level of sex, but on the level of kinship. So you see what I'm saying here? Yes. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the prohibition of homosexual practice or the flip side, the affirmation of a male-female requirement for sexual ethics is not for Jesus or anyone else in scripture, merely one sexual offense among others that are all basically equal. Right. It is the foundation for everything else that follows and the basis upon which every other sexual ethics standard is derived. So that when we get rid of this, it's like, Andy, it's like, It'd be like pulling the floor out from under where you're sitting right now. Yeah. You got nothing left to, to hold you up. Yeah. And that's why this is so, that is why the issue of homosexual practice is so central to the church's witness right now. Because getting rid of the rejection of that or getting rid of the affirmation of a male female foundation for sexual unions is getting rid of, even if people don't realize it automatically, it's getting rid of all sexual ethic standards. There right. is nothing left. If this one doesn't hold, they all fall like dominoes. We may not be logically consistent to make that connection. Eventually we will. Yeah. But, but the point is, logical consistency would lead to the elimination of all other standards. So this is interesting. It, just on this podcast a few weeks ago, I had somebody come on and, and uh, highlighting the work in three denominations, the Salvation Army, the Church of Nazarene, and the United Methodist Church. And one of the people who represented the progressive side, I was trying to give them an opportunity to speak, and I couldn't help myself. I had to jump in a little bit, and I ended up saying one thing, and, and the the person on the other end, the, the pr progressive voice, accused me of making a slippery slope argument. And, and I wish I would have come up this earlier, but I said, no, no, this is the, we are, we are already there. There is, this isn't a, a, we're not skiing down a slope. We're cross country skiing. We can see it around us. There is no slope. Uh, like what you're saying, like the, the elimination of any other type of prohibition against any other sexual action will be gone. Right. You could uh, eliminate incest. You couldn't eliminate polyamory because those both of those standards, the standard of only two in a sexual union and the necessity of complementary otherness on the part of the participants is all derived from the male female foundation for sexual ethics, which automatically eliminates homosexual practice. So you're absolutely right. People do argue as if there is a slippery slope so that by approving homosexual unions, we're going to get something worse. Yeah, yeah. We've already done the worst in terms of adult consensual human relationships, interhuman relationships. There are other forms of sexual practice that are words that say adult child sex, or moving outside the human species, bestiality. Right. But other than those two, when you're dealing with adult, consensual, intrahuman sexual activity, there is, in the biblical view of things, nothing worse than homosexual practice, precisely because homosexual practice assaults the very foundation of sexual ethics, and that makes it worse. Because yeah. everything I mean, else topples with it that you've already leapfrogged over to get to the bottom of the hill. Right. Yeah, you're exa exactly right. And one of the things we deal with in, in working in seminary education, and you've been you know, a, a theological educator for years, is that sometimes people come in with what I call more of a folk theology about the nature of sin, it's like suggesting somehow that all sins are equal. But you've kept using the same language worse. And like one of the things we have to help people see is there's differences of degrees and results of sin as well. And as, as, as like a biblical scholar, I mean, that's, that's something that's basically right in the text for us to be able to evaluate. You know, there was one occasion when I was debating a lawyer on this question. It's actually going to be a TV show, but it never oh. made it, never made it beyond the initial stage, but it was going to be a controversial issues. They have lawyers on both sides and theologians on both sides. And it was about a pizza issue, whether or not you'd have to sell pizza uh, for a gay wedding. And okay. uh, so the lawyer was trying to humiliate me over my claim that all sins are equal, because that was his claim. All sins are equal. And of course, he was thinking of light sins. And yeah. so if we were going to uh, call homosexual practice a sin, it wouldn't be any worse sin than, for example, gluttony. 
Yeah. You know, or or maybe a, a, a fleeting uh, a cons- a, a fleeting acquiescence to sexual temptation. And so then I made the comparison with incest and he got outraged. Oh, that yeah. is so horrible. How can you say this is like incest? And I thought you said, I, I responded to him and said, I thought you said all sin was equal. Well, apparently <laughs> it wasn't for him. Incest was yeah. really bad and he was outraged yeah, yeah. and I would compare homosexual practice to it. So that just goes to show he didn't operate under a principle that all sin is equal. And in fact, who could? Who, yeah. could, who could actually yeah. act that way? Why right. did when Moses is coming down the Mount Sinai, God said, <laughs> go down because Israel is committing with the golden calf a great sin. Right. Well, how can it be a great sin if all sin is equal? There's, there's no meaning to a great sin. If all yeah. sins are great, well, you know, you shouldn't get any more worked up over this, over an argument that took place between two Israelites when they left Egypt, over whose yeah. property this particular element was. It's all equal. But yeah. nobody thinks that. Nobody believes that. Even in sexual ethics, nobody believes that. Look at the culture. We accept we condone remarriage after divorce, even invalid, invalid divorce. Right. Right. But we don't yet accept or approve of officially yet, although we will, polyamorous relationships, right, multiple right, right. partner concurrent unions. Why is that? I would suggest because we think that's worse. Yeah. <laughs> and accommodation in the area of remarriage after divorce, serial polygamy is not as bad as accommodation to concurrent polygamy. Right. And worse still would be sex with your parents or adult child. Right. right. So we do have a graded hierarchical scale, not only of sins generally, but of sexual offenses. And right. everybody in knows a legal that. sense, not just in a biblical sense. That's right. Okay, I want to make sure to get. I, 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 we will get to your argument about gay weddings from First Corinthians five. I want it, but I want to, you to tell a story that it's made a, a deep impact on me. And, and as it relates to, as you're kind of like laying out the groundwork for the, a biblical view and why it's so important based upon creation. Um, you, did, I, I heard your story with Bill Loader, where you were in a debate with him, and um, he gave you a point. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, can, can you tell us that story? Yeah, there was a, a Society of Biblical Literature national meeting in, in Baltimore, uh, and uh, one of the se- sessions was on his recent book on the New Testament and sexuality. He's got about 80 pages there, and I'm his chief di- on, on homosexuality, and I'm his chief dialogue partner. So I was yeah. there on the panel. This was before the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer hermeneutic session. Right. And, and those asked, things like, are which happening. One, <laughs> which one didn't belong in that session? That would be me. Uh, everyone <laughs> else on the panel identified as gay or lesbian. Just me. Uh, I, Bill Loder, I don't think, identifies as such. Or, but, of course, he was affirming the LGBTQ ideology. But he's a good enough New Testament scholar uh, that he recognizes that uh, Scripture, no great protagonist, positive protagonist in Scripture would support homosexual unions, even entered into a committed same-sex union, wouldn't they were not supporting. And he even acknowledged that for Jesus, because I made this point in my um, paper presentation to what he had written, the few areas where we still disagree. And I think everyone in the audience, because it was basically the whole LGBTQ crowd, was expecting Loder to make mincemeat of me. And instead, what they found out is basically we agree in most instances about how to read the biblical text on homosexual practice. So he got up and he he basically acknowledged that. He said, I I agree with Dr. Gagnon that uh, Jesus would not have accepted any form of homosexual union committed or otherwise. And I'm thinking to myself, if this is the hill you want to die on, (laughs) great, you know, (laughs) because he added, you know, that, uh, that Jesus simply had insufficient knowledge to make that determination. You know, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, well, you know, our Savior Lord, uh, clearly he thinks the male-female prerequisite is the foundation for all sexual ethics based on a citation on Genesis 127, followed by Genesis 224, man may become joined to a woman to become one flesh. Clearly Jesus thinks that this is of central significance. And if our Lord can't accurately tell us what is of central significance 
in sexual ethics, then we've got a bigger problem than right. the issue of homosexual right. practice. Bad as that is, we have the problem of how and what sense can jesus be lord that's right we simply shouldn't be paying attention to him at all if he's that far wrong right that what he considers the foundation of sexual ethics in fact should be in, should be the opposite right right then just acknowledge jesus is not lord for you anymore at that point right it's really saying that jesus had insufficient knowledge which is a nice way of saying it, or jesus was wrong so like that's the foundation for understanding the apostolic witness. This is also the understanding for thinking about the nature of like why even the new, other New Testament writers would deal with this. And so you make a really helpful argument. I'll say as we as we get into rather not a faithful Christian should attend a gay wedding. Um, I've I've made an argument for this in the past, and your article helped me and challenged me that I've not made the best argument. And I won't tell you what my argument is first, but I love how you bring in. First Corinthians five. This is a key text for us seeing out this. And, and thankfully, you've already built the case for incest. But there's the situation with the incestuous man. Tell us how that applies and is a good analogy for uh, rather not we should attend a gay wedding. Yeah, so in First Corinthians five, Paul deals with a case of sexual immorality going on in Corinth, and it is a man who is having a sexual relationship with his stepmother. We don't know anything else beyond that about it about exactly the specifics of that relationship, nor do we need to, nor did even Paul need to. Because right. obviously when Paul heard about this, that they were tolerating this case of egregious sexual immorality, he hit the roof. He just could hardly believe it, that this would be the case, that anybody could approve of such a thing as this as the church, in the church, since it's such an irreducible minimum of sexual ethics. And it's clear that Paul wants that relationship to have stopped yesterday. Yeah. Imagine some imagine the Corinthians arguing something similar to the issue of homosexual practice. Don't Paul, you don't get it. They want to make this a committed, loving, permanent, monogamous relationship. Surely that will change your perspective. Right. <laughs> I mean, if they they were to argue that Paul, Paul would just draw up his hands. I mean, yet yeah. this community, as Paul said, was puffed up or inflated with pride over their ability to tolerate this relationship. Paul can hardly believe that. Now, this relationship, why is this a good analogy? Because as we've already established, the reason why incest is wrong, even between consenting adults in a committed, loving, long-term monogamous union is the same reason why homosexual practice is wrong. And it's the, it's the standard set by the prohibition of homosexual practice that sets the standard for the rejection of incest, which while regarded as extremely severe among sexual offenses is still not as severe as the issue of homosexual practice. Because incest does not violate the foundation of sexual ethics directly. The prohibition of incest is extrapolated secondarily from the male-female prerequisite or prohibition of homosexual practice. That's why, that's why when you deal with the incest text in Leviticus 18 and 20, you have lots of commands. The lots of commands about incest don't indicate incest is worse, but rather more difficult to prescribe. Right. You've got to define the boundaries and borders of what incest is, what would be allowable, what wouldn't be. With uh, whereas with regard to homosexual practice, all you have to do is give a single command because it's all wrong. Yeah. Period. Now you get the patriarchs participating in some in what would later be regarded as incestuous acts. Abraham married to his stepsister, half sister rather, not step stepsister, half sister Sarah. Jacob married to two sisters simultaneously. Those yeah. will later be regarded as violation of Levitical incest law, but that comes after the patriarchal period. Right. So you have a sort of some degree of fluidity where the loopholes are closed off at later stages, but still relatively early in the Mosaic period. Then I would ask people, 
but about homosexual practice. When was the loophole, a Andy? Here's a yeah. trick question. Where was when was the loophole for homosexual practice closed off in scripture? There was never a loophole. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's like it's, it's, uh, I often use the language from our our uh, method that we use for hermeneutics. Um, we we encourage students to look at the canonical dialogue. You know, like how different voices speak in progressive revelation. But I say on uh, in this issue, it's a monologue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and 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 now, not a trick question, but okay. relevant to our discussion, uh, is when did the loophole for uh, polygynous, i.e., female polygamy, uh, male male polygamy with multiple females, when yeah. did that loophole? get closed off well for certain jesus closed it off but maybe there's something earlier that's right jesus is the one for christians who closed off that loophole uh actually the essenes did also close it off slightly earlier well about a century century and a half earlier for their devotees the essenes associated with the dead sea scrolls very rigorous observance of the mosaic law thought that the pharisees were wimps when it came to observing that law and and they closed off the loophole for polygamy on the basis of Genesis 127, male and female who created them. Same yeah. principle Jesus would operate with a century, century and a half later. Now, my point of all that is simply saying the later the principle here is the later the loophole is closed off, the less severe the offense. Okay, interesting. So the fact that polyamorous relationships are not closed off to a later period, the new covenant period for Christians, a little bit earlier than that for just one small segment of Judaism. But for most of Judaism, not closed off until much later than the time of Jesus. Indicates it's a less severe offense than incest, where the loopholes are closed off relatively early in the Mosaic period, but not completely in the patriarchal period. Right. And as you quite rightly noted with regard to homosexual practice, there never, never was a loophole. From the creation text in Genesis 1, 2 on, that's, again, another indication that homosexual practice is not just the equal of incest in terms of severity, it's worse. So we go to 1 Corinthians 5 and look at this. We shouldn't say, well, that might not apply because incest is worse. No, it's the other way around. Mm. Homosexual practice is worse than incest. And if Paul is so hot under the collar about the incest, even involving affine relationships, that is, there's not a strict blood relationship between the man and his stepmother. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not even the worst form. Right, of incest. exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just on the outlier. It, 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 Paul, you it's know, in early principle. Judaism wanted yeah. to make sure you would never get close to crossing into the boundaries of actual blood, close blood relation incest. So we're going to cover the borders even with legal incest relationships. Okay, wow. by legal, I mean... Uh, only affine relationships. You're not actually related to the person in question, but you you're in the slot for somebody that's related in a legal basis. Yes. Here in this case, as his mother, more specifically it's, his stepmother. It's so still we, called first, incest. First, he still identifies first, as incest, even though in it there is a technical sense that it's not. Yeah, that's right. So we have a case of incest that's not even remotely the most severe form of incest. And incest itself, even in its most severe forms, is not as severe as homosexual practice. Yet Paul still hits the roof that there could be any sort of tolerance of this behavior, right? So what does Paul recommend in this chapter? Yes, he recommends yes. that they... Church discipline. Church yeah, discipline, yeah. what we no longer practice, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. You put him out of the community. That means he cannot participate in the Eucharist in the common meal, celebrating Christ's redemption of you. Now, Paul's not assuming that he's not a believer. He's questioning whether this guy is a genuine believer. Mm -hmm. He refers to him as a person who calls himself a brother. Right. Later, he gives an analogy about a genuine believer with Christ in him in 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 12 to 20, about seeking sex with a prostitute. There he makes clear in that analogy, he's talking about a genuine believer in whom Christ indwells, making it all the worst, not better, but worse. I mean, that's like having sex and moral sexual intercourse, not outside the temple, but on top of the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, which is even worse. 
Right. Same thing if Jesus indwells you as your believer, your sexual immorality is not better for that reason. It's worse because mm. in an odd, perverse sort of way, you're bringing God into it in a one flesh sexual union. So later in the second half of First Corinthians 6, Paul is assuming, it, making an analogy with a genuine believer. So effectively saying, I don't know whether this guy who's having sex with his stepmother is a genuine believer or not. But irrespective, this guy is going to hell. Wow. And instead of celebrating your ability to tolerate this case of egregious immorality, you should be doing what people normally do at a funeral. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Mourning. He says, shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship this man who has been doing this? Exactly. Because everything is at stake with this person. Not just their loss of life, not their loss of life in this world, but their eternal loss of life in the next. So yeah. that's why Paul gives this uh, two vice or offender list at the end of chapter five. You're not to associate with such a person who identifies himself as a believer, not even to eat with such a one. And then he takes that same vice list that he gave at the end of chapter five and in chapter six, verses nine to ten. He reiterates it, adding three sexual offenses, including men lying with a male and yep. soft men, men who actively feminize themselves to attract male sex partners among those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. So clearly, this is what he believes about the incestuous man. You're tolerating a form of behavior that could lead to his permanent exclusion from the kingdom of God, irrespective. Of whether he identify of whether he is a genuine believer now or not. This is his fate. You cannot in any way endorse that kind of behavior because it leads to their eternal destruction. Now, I will grant you that 1 Corinthians 5 does not directly address the question of attending an incestuous <laughs> wedding. Right, right. I concede this point, but I simply want to ask people. Based on Paul's remarks in 1 Corinthians 5, what is the likelihood that Paul would accept any rationalization on the part of the Corinthian believers that they should attend such an incestuous wedding mm. that solemnizes before God and, and sexual behavior that is abhorrent to God? Yes. And which could lead to that person's exclusion from the kingdom of God forever. What is the likelihood that Paul would say, you know, that's a that's a Romans 14 issue. <laughs> He's I write that's this in a book. Agree yeah. to disagree. Let's pray about it. Yeah. Let's pray about it. Let's see whether, you know, is it okay to attend an incestuous wedding? Right. Now, I, I would be willing to hazard the supposition that today, even Christians like Timothy Dalrymple of Christianity Today, like Preston Sprinkle, like Andy Stanley, like Focus on the Family, if you ask them the question, would you attend a wedding between your sibling and your father or mother? Wow. <laughs> and I'd be willing to guess, I'm going to go on a limb here, and I'm going to say they would not. Right. And why then would they attend the one thing, a gay wedding, but not attend the other, the incestuous wedding? Wow, this is such a great argument, Robert. I really appreciate you bringing this to my attention. I think that we can point back to this regularly to, to, to be able to help people see that the case of incest really is a helpful analogy for us to confront contemporary issues. Now, let me tell you my argument, which isn't a bad one, and you, you started to get there a little bit, is that, and maybe it just becomes, because I'm not a biblical scholar and more of a theologian or his, historical person, and, and that I, I look at it as a liturgical issue. Like I've thought, well, the no matter what happens, this is something that's done before God, and there's a liturgical element in both the ceremony and the celebration that the the body is affirming, and and whether or not the liturgy says it or not, generally the liturgy will. Does anybody object to the this marriage? It gives the opportunity for the congregation to assent to it, or or to ensure or in turn show their agreement, or if there's any celebration 
that happens in a party, dancing, raising a drink, or rather or not, is there, uh, of course, if not an alcoholic drink uh, at Wesley Biblical Seminary. Um, but uh, if, if you have this, like if you're in that situation or even writing a, a congratulations Facebook message to somebody who's recently been married. Um, so that's been my argument. And I guess you wouldn't disagree with that, but I like yours better uh, of going first to 1 Corinthians 5. What do you think? What is it that's happening in a wedding, though? Like, what are we doing? I mean, people would say, oh, Robert, these are just my friends. I want them to know I love them. Yeah. And, and the argument you made, it's a great argument. I use that argument also. It's a different, it's just a different kind of argument. Um, the incest uh, analogy is just simply that. It's analogical reasoning. Here's, here's an analogy. Would you do it in this case? No, you wouldn't. Why? And it's the reason why is because they recognize incest is really bad. Yeah. But because we've been so saturated with approving gay relationships in the culture of uh, people who endorse attending a gay wedding but not an incestuous wedding are doing so because they don't regard homosexual practice any longer to be even as severe as incest when in fact the scriptural perspective on the issue is not only is it as bad it's worse yeah but yeah you're absolutely right about the nature here it's this is not simply eating at somebody's home right we, we're not talking here about you you can't eat with somebody uh, or even persons who uh, who claim to be married or in a same sex and a same sex union. You can eat in their home. You can fraternize with them in various sorts of ways. But a Love wedding. Them, but yeah, be welcoming. Yeah, all the kind that's of right. Be welcoming in various sorts of ways. But a wedding is something different altogether. A wedding is a ritual before God in which those who are present are present as witnesses of that union, where mm -hmm. essentially they are investing themselves in the retention in the long-term permanence of that union. You're there not only witnessing to it, you're there to say, I'm covenanting with you to yes. do what I can to make sure that this relationship lasts. Yes. I will be a help in that, not a hindrance, but I will be a help. What is going on in a wedding? Well, two people are committing themselves in a sexual union to remain in that union for the rest of their lives, come whenever they, they may. Now, when you take an immoral sexual union and you try to convert it into a wedding ceremony, then the two partners are, or more, if it's polyamorous, are committing to continue to engage in abhorrent Sexual activity, sexual activity hateful to God for the rest of their life. I'm going to commit myself to doing this, yes. which is also committing themselves never to repent of doing it. Hmm. Right. That's what makes it so severe. That's why you can't a Christian can't possibly go there and participate. Their very presence, whether or not they know it. Whether or not they've said anything to the couple otherwise is there to affirm the union. Otherwise, don't be present, right? If you know, think of think of what you have to, you've mentioned some things you have to do at a wedding. I have an older daughter that got married this past summer. Yeah. Completely joyous occasion. I delivered the homily. It was loads of fun from beginning end because I was so happy that my daughter had found this great guy, both them thoroughly committed to the Lord. I mean, we were just so rejoicing throughout the whole thing. How can you go to a wedding and right. not rejoice? Right. It's simply not possible at any point. The whole point of the wedding is to celebrate the union of these persons. And there are various ways in which that's manifested. You mentioned it's not just at the wedding ceremony itself. Uh, it's it's also the after part of the wedding, right? Right. You're toasting to the couple, etc. Uh, you're dancing. Uh, not all weddings. I, not a lot of Christian weddings don't accept dancing. <laughs> my my uh, in laws, uh, future in laws, said there'll be no dancing at the wedding, so we did okay. not do any dancing at the wedding. Um, and uh, but that's okay. You know, everyone has a different perspective of that. Whether there's dancing or not, it's celebration. Right, That's right, the right. whole leitmotif of the entire occasion, right? And what are you going to do? Everyone's applauding when the, you know, the, the bride and groom are leaving after the service, you know? When you go to the reception line, we're yeah, going to yeah. say, oh, that was so lovely. Well, I mean, 
you know, yeah, everything's an affirmation of the wedding, right? Everything. And even, that's right. I even mean, writing there, on a yeah, go ahead. Sorry, even writing on a Facebook relation, wall. If this were a blood relation, I would be crying the whole time. They don't want me Hello. there. Yeah, it wouldn't be tears of joy. I would be depressed, crying, upset for somebody I love committing herself to a relationship that could yeah. lead to the exclusion of the kingdom of God permanently. How can I possibly be happy in an occasion like that? Right. So they shouldn't right. even want me there if that's going right. to be my attitude towards it. The only way I could be there is by some way participating in the celebration and affirming my role as both a witness and as a guarantor of the long term survival of that relationship. That mm. I cannot do. A ritual is a totally different thing. So, what is the parallel in First Corinthians to that kind of ritual? There actually is a parallel. We okay. find it in 1 Corinthians 8 and in 1 Corinthians 10. It's over the question of whether or not you can eat idol meat in an idol's temple. Oh, interesting. Yes, yes, yes. Now, now, granted, this involves idolatry, not sexual immorality, but Paul is always connecting those two things. Right. One on the vertical level, the other on a horizontal level. Uh, Romans 1, 18 and 32 is a classic example. Idolatry is a classic expression of the suppression of the truth about who God is, readily accessible in the material structures of the created order, still visible in nature. What is, what is sexual immorality, for which he pinpoints primarily homosexual practice in Romans 124 to 127, immediately following the indictment of idolatry? That is a very similar thing. It's suppressing the truth about the way God made us. A truth readily apparent in the material structures of our human bodies. Right. Which you have to, have, have to, have to actively suppress in order to approve of, right? So it's, it's the perfect horizontal correlation to the vertical dimension of why idolatry is wrong. So why is going to an idol's temple wrong? You're in the ancient world, the, the idol's temples are the restaurants of antiquity. Okay. okay. So if you're celebrating a birth of a loved of a child, you're celebrating a wedding, you're celebrating a business deal, whatever it is you're celebrating, chances are you're going to invite the people you know and love, you're going to send invitations to them, and it's going to be held at an idol's temple. Because the meat first gets funneled to the idol in sacrifice, and then right. some portions of that are left for the celebrants. So where Paul says, you know what? You can eat idol meat in other venues, in your own home privately, or in somebody else's home if nobody raises the question about where this meat came from. Right. But you can't go to an idol's temple and eat this meat because that's part of a larger set of right. ritual activities involving a pagan god. And when you do that, you're even if you don't know it, you're essentially covenanting, not with pagan gods because they don't have reality, but with the demons behind those unreal pagan gods. Yeah. And Paul gives this great rhetorical question. You're not stronger than God, are you? Yeah. Okay, so... Of course not. Right. You don't want to tip God off because if the big man comes down, he'll wipe you out. It doesn't take anything right. for him to do that. That's what's happening in the ritual of a same sex wedding. Mm. You're involving yourself in a covenant activity that is absolutely abhorrent to God. And the worst form of sexual offense imaginable among consenting human adults. Mm. There is no way that you can do that, and God is going to step aside, and that's not going to be a problem for God. Hmm. Paul would have issued the same remark if there had been an incestuous wedding with the incestuous man at Corinth and his stepmother. He would have issued the same remark, you're not stronger than God, are you? Right. So you can't do that. So even if you could, some people want to argue, well, first of all, the uh, incestuous man claims that he's a believer. What if it's with the unbelievers? It's the same thing. You're going to an idol's temple, celebrating with an unbeliever who has yeah. invited you to the temple. The fact that he's an unbeliever doesn't make it acceptable for you to go to that ritual occurrence. That's solemnizing an event that is abhorrent to God, offensive to God, and connecting yourself with idolatrous forces. That's what's happening also in an immoral sexual union of this order. 
Wow. This is so helpful. And you think about the argument as a whole, just as you're saying all this, moving through from 1 Corinthians 5 through 6, then 8 and 10. But I, I'm also looking even in uh, thinking of 1 Corinthians 5, the giving over to the accuser, giving over to Satan, the destruction of the body, then leading to the, the climax of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, the nature of the resurrection of the body. And, and, and that's based upon Jesus' resurrection. It just shows the importance of our bodies. And um, Christopher West, who, you know, we are really thankful to have you at our conference this past February uh, on rather or not this represents uh, human sexuality as a matter of an essential or dogma. And Christopher West, he has a great book and the title of his book describes this well. I think you might've uh, been a part of that. So at least quoted in there, our bodies tell God's story. Our bodies are describing this reality. Oh, this is yeah, so our bodies interesting. Are a narrative, exactly, of God's story, of God's redemptive uh, created and uh, God's creation and redemptive work in our lives. And what we do with our bodies absolutely matters. Paul makes this point at the end of 1 Corinthians 6, right? When he rejects the, any possibility of a Christian man having sex with a prostitute, where well, he might think, well, that's really bad. I can understand why he rejects that. But Paul regards that as creating a one flesh union, even though it's, it, it has the least personal investment involved in it, right. right? Because it's a material transaction to some extent. You're paying the person for that. It's not an actual relationship. But even that relationship, Paul says, involves the body holistically right. in an act of sexual immorality where you're becoming one flesh with another person in an immoral sexual union while your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit that is in you mm -hmm. and that you don't belong to yourself. So you're already one spirit with Jesus, and now you're taking that one spirit union and you're uniting it in a one flesh immoral sexual union. Outrageous. Yes. Absolutely the sin outrageous. against the body. That's right. It is right. Every other bit, every other sin by comparison could be called a sin outside the body. A little bit of hyperbole, but more or less. But this is a sin, holistic sin against the body, which is the temple of the spirit that is indwelling you. You were bought with a price by Christ's atoning debt. You don't belong to yourself. You don't own your body. You can't do whatever you want with your body because your body belongs to the Lord. And by the way, yeah. you quite rightly noted, you move to chapter five, through chapters eight to 10, through chapter 15. They're involving a doctrinal issue. And let's add to this chapter 13. Oh, yeah, sure. The hymn of love. The Amen. hymn to love that, that Paul gives, right? So we can't say that Paul, in writing this letter to the Corinthians, really doesn't know about love adequately, right? If right. he did, he would support attending a gay wedding. Yeah. Support attending an incestuous wedding. Support intending going to an idol's temple so long as you don't acknowledge that the idols are real. Paul doesn't do that. Yeah. Paul knows love better than anybody else today yeah. in the evangelical communion or outside of it in the church who claims that the loving thing is to go to such a wedding. Mm -hmm. Paul knows what love is. Love does not, love rejoices in the truth. Yes. Love has no participation in wrongdoing, right? So why can also talk in 2 Corinthians 6 about not becoming partners, koinonoi, with unbelievers. Yeah. Right? You, granted, Paul says, right, you can't, you can't disassociate from all unbelievers who are immoral because all unbelievers are immoral by definition, and you'd have to be beamed up out of the world. But that's not the same thing as becoming partners Koinonoi with unbelievers yeah. in their activities. And that includes these ritual celebrations, whether they be of false gods or whether they be of immoral sexual unions. You cannot become a partner with that kind of episode. Paul knows what love is, and he knows that his recommendation of church discipline. Now, clearly, by the way, let's recognize that if Paul is saying you're not even to associate with such a one, you yeah. can't be attending his wedding. Right, sure. That's right, by definition. Yeah. Right, because that's that's not only an association, but it's a high caliber association with that right. individual in a ritual celebrating the very activity which is supposed to preclude your association with him. Right. So clearly, Paul does not think 
there's no way. That's that's why I say, I mean, there's no way you can argue that Paul could have, even though he doesn't address the question of an incestuous wedding, given the fact that he says you can't associate with such a one, it's obvious what his answer would be to the question of whether you could attend a, an incestuous wedding. Yeah. You clearly can't because you're not to associate with such a one, right? So that, that should yeah. be straightforward right from the get-go. Paul is this still the same person in 1 Corinthians 13 who knows what love is. Yeah. So never, I'm talking to our audience here today, never fall for the line that if you're going to be loving and if you're going to have an opportunity for further missionary work with this person, you have to attend this wedding. Yeah. Mm. That is a lie. Now, there are lots of other ways that we've noted you can continue to associate with such a person if the person is an unbeliever. Right. But attending a wedding, a ritual ceremony celebrating the act, that you absolutely cannot do, Paul right. says. There are plenty of other ways in which you can be loving. Remember what's happening here. If you give up at this point, let's say you have a child, identifies as gay or lesbian, is getting married to a person of right, the same sure. sex. Like Preston right? Sprinkle says, you should go to your kid's wedding. And That's right, right. Because yeah. he says, if you don't, you might never see them again, and that will close off any further mission opportunities with them. That is a bad argument because there are other ways in which you can show your love, which don't involve you in being complicit in the immoral sexual union, which would be what was would be what would be happening if you attended that service. There are other ways in which you can show that. But if you relent on this, you've established a principle to your child that you are susceptible to manipulation and extortion. Mm. Wow. Because if you don't come to my wedding, I will have nothing to do with you in the future. Yes. Well, yes. that argument, if you concede to that, you've essentially said, you know what? Our relationship is not equal here, yeah, right? Yeah. Because you can make these kinds of extortions and manipulative ploys on me, okay? And I always have to bend to you, but my own values mean nothing to you. Right, right. We're this not going to love. establish a relationship. I don't care how much I love you. We cannot establish a relationship of that order where my values, which are set by God and by my Lord Jesus Christ, are entirely negotiable if they offend you. Mm -hmm. You are not imp more important than my Lord. Wow. I love you. I give up my life for you. But I am not going to violate the will of my God and Savior. Wow. Wow. You are not that important. And I'm not dissing you by saying that. I'm just saying you're not my creator. Wow. You're not my redeemer. And I cannot apostatize for your sake. Wow. <laughs> but if you concede on the wedding, you've established the point that your values before the Lord come second to your child. Wow. And that automatically sets the stage for the future that they can continue to manipulate you, continue to extort you until you finally renege on the whole principle of sexual ethics. Dr. That Gavin, God you did are not intentionally design us as male and female. Can you do that? You can't yeah. do that as a believer. Right. Oh. It, when we think of it in these terms, Andy, isn't it amazing that any evangelicals would say this is a Romans 14, agree to disagree, matter of indifference, ethical issue, and you can do what you want. Yeah. It's like, I'm are you telling you, me? I, I have you I'm even so opened scripture? Yeah. I, I, I just appreciate your willingness to say it this clearly. And, and that's what I've appreciated about your scholarship. And in general, it's like we have to have, have the willingness to say something that is hard. Um, I, I wonder, your colleague at Houston uh, Christian University, uh, my old professor, uh, Jerry Walls, who I really admire and appreciate, you know, he also has a way of speaking clearly on a number of issues. Um, but he, he, he Jerry's proposed a great guy. this idea. We get together on Friday nights with our other friend, David Baggett. We have wonderful oh, yeah. movie nights, fellowship with each other, pray. Oh, it's just great. He's you should put a video oh, yeah. camera on of those of you guys together. That'd be fun. Uh, but oh, that would be. <laughs> I can't. That I can't would even. Be a scream. 
I love it. And uh, boy, moral philosophy. There you go. Well, let me, I, you know, he, Jerry Wall says an interesting thing. Like he wondered if the reason Christians aren't willing to speak out on this issue is because of the sin of fornication. Like, and, and I think there's something to that because, and, and that is, you know, any, any sex, sexual activity outside of marriage. So premarital sex in that, in that, in that case, and not, that's one example. So like, I think there's something to that, 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 that weakens us, but that we, you've said it a few times and, and thinking of Jerry Walls, uh, the doctrine of hell uh, as well, like that this could lead this obstinance, this willful choosing to reject God is the type of character trait that if it's not handled could lead to somebody um, moving to a place of eternally rejecting God, like e eternal damnation. So, so in a sense, as C.S. Lewis says, God would say to you, to the individual, thy will be done eternally. That's right. And it, that gets at an important reason why Christians so frequently hoist the white flag on this issue. And it's because we all have our own sexual sins. Right. If only in our thought life, right? It's very much harder to manage one's thought life than sure. it is one's actual physical outward concrete behavior. And so we all have a certain amount of guilt, especially men, with regard to sexual ethics, because it's a struggle. It's a constant struggle with our thought life. And we look at the adultery of a heart statement that Jesus makes in the yeah, Sermon sure. on the Mount, and we say, oh, you know, and then we feel like we can't have a voice on sexual ethics. And, and in fact, then we try to give ourselves an exemption because if we give an exemption to the issue of homosexual unions, or at least to accommodating at another level to the extent of attending a gay wedding, then we get a pass Yeah, for what we do, which exonerates us in our right. eyes. The only problem is it's sort of like a mutual human agreement to exonerate each other, but we're overlooking the judge Overall, the creator, the creator, and redeemer of the universe, yeah, who isn't participating in this exoneration that's taking <laughs> that's place. Right. I mean, it's a wonderful exoneration party, but God, who gets the invitation, doesn't attend, right? Because He sets the standard, and it doesn't matter whether we give each other a pass. There is no moral goodness to to being more consistently disobedient to the will of God. Has the church made some accommodations on sexual activity that it should not have made? Yes. Does that mean that we should extend the, keep extending those accommodations to right. even more severe offenses so as to be more consistent in our disobedience yeah. of the will of God? There's no value to that. Yeah. God doesn't want us to be more consistently disobedient to him. Yeah. He wants us to move more, recognizing our inconsistencies, because we are still indwelt by sin. God wants us to continue to hold the line in places that we're holding the line, and then move more consistently to extend that line in other areas where we have been compromising and should not have been. Yeah. So never, person should never fall for the line. Well, we've already accommodated to divorce and, yeah. uh, and remarriage. Uh, therefore, we should continue to accommodate. Well, that overlooks several things. That's not a virtue, being more consistently disobedient. And number two, it overlooks the fact that some sins are more severe than others. Right. And however bad remarriage after invalid divorce is, and it is wrong, and I've written about it, it is wrong. Yes. It's still not as severe as polyamory. Right. It's still not as severe as incest. And it's certainly not as severe as homosexual practice. So compromising at one level, there's no logical correlation with that to compromising at an even greater level. Right, right. And that's what we would have to do here. And I appreciate you bringing it. And people can just Google you and find where you have spoken about divorce. And, and you've said every time an invalid divorce. So I just want to highlight that. Some people might want to bring that up. I want to ask you one more question on this. I have two more questions all together, but one more question. Um, uh, and, and this, I think this will be a softball your way, but it is the argument that a lot of people have in our postmodern times that, that they face is they'll say, well, this is just your interpretation. Right. This is this is just, you know, the, yeah, yeah. You've studied for a long time, but but I 
in all of my wisdom, have a different interpretation. Um, what's the problem with that? Well, I do get that a lot. And um, let me tell you, as a professor of New <laughs> Testament, when people turn in exegesis papers, I don't hold the view that everybody's interpretation is equal. Right. If I did, I couldn't grade any exegesis paper. Right. <laughs> Some people just don't make a good argument for a position that they have. Now, by the way, I once when I was at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, I was able to get away with, just once with teaching a course on the Bible and homosexuality. I gave the top grade, an A+, plus, to a Unitarian Universalist student who had an entirely different perspective on the issue. Okay. So I don't I don't grade people down for disagreeing with me. Uh, I grade people down for not having good arguments. Okay. I, whether or not they agree with me, right? I want to know, did the person study the issue and come up with good arguments, pros and cons to address the matter? And not all arguments are equal. So if somebody comes up to me and says, well, I have a different opinion and all interpretations are equal. I say, well, even you don't believe that. Right. I can give you lots of interpretations about biblical texts that you would say, well, that's ridiculous. Yes. There are some things about the Bible that are difficult to understand and the arguments are close pro and con, but there are a lot of other things that are pretty obvious, right? If you write to me and say that Paul is trying to persuade the Galatian converts to get circumcised, when in fact the whole the letter is doing the exact opposite. Right, right. And you claim that that first interpretation is the same as interpreting it. it, it Galatians is meaning Paul is trying to get them to reject circumcision. Then I'm saying to you, you haven't read the text. Yeah. Study it a little more carefully. So I would say to somebody is, if you think your interpretation, for example, on the question of attending a gay wedding, is equal to the one that I just presented, then make the arguments yeah, and show me how the arguments are wrong, okay? Uh, to this date, I have not seen that. Right. You'd have to show how the analogy between incest and homosexual practice is a bad analogy, when in fact, I would argue, it's the best analogy because it has the most points of substantive correspondence with the thing to which it is being compared. In this case, homosexual practice with incest. That's the definition of a good analogy. Yeah, you bad analogical reasoning is when you prefer an analogy that has fewer points of correspondence. So if you make the argument, as some have made, right. you're some of you are willing to attend a remarriage after a divorce. Therefore, you should be willing to attend a gay wedding. OK, well, first of all, if the remarriage after the divorce was by a man who di who divorced his wife because he was sleeping with another woman then wants to marry that woman after divorcing his wife, I would not be attending right, right. that ceremony, first of all. But even if somebody did attend such a ceremony, you would still be making the assumption that homosexual practice is no worse than remarriage after divorce, and assuming that remarriage after divorce is no worse than incest, an incestuous marriage or wedding, and no worse than a polyamorous wedding. And nobody would argue that. Right. They recognize differences in degree of severity and attending one less severe, though still wrong, ritual event doesn't get you to attending a more severe wrong ritual event, right? Yes. So that would be an example where if somebody brought that up as an analogy, I'd say, here's why your analogy doesn't work. And after I pointed that out, what are they going to come back with? Right. They got nothing. Yeah. Right. If they wanted to argue to me that Paul would have approved such an att attendance of a ritual ceremony of that egregious sort, historically, it's a no-brainer he would not have. Right. And the same applies to Jesus. Since Jesus regarded the male-female requirement as the foundation of everything else, so you would have to argue not only that Jesus would attend a gay wedding, but Jesus would have intended an incestuous wedding. Right. And he would have intended a polyamorous wedding. And we don't know that he wouldn't have done those. So clearly you would have no argument. So all interpretations equal, not been my experience in life. Give me your best argument. Yeah. And it has to be moving us to the place where we, I think the next step would just have to be if people would want to move away from that, they're just moving away. They have to admit 
they're moving away from scripture's authority. The, the, the authority right. that, that scripture has any function as a divine rule that can use in a Protestant language of Christian faith and practice. Um, if you're so attending I, I, a gay wedding, you're telling me, sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead, keep going. Uh, if, you're, if a person is attending a gay wedding, that person is telling me, certainly this person does not regard homosexual practice as a particularly severe sexual offense, not on the order at least of incest and polyamory, which they would not attend a wedding ceremony for. That they're definitely telling me. And that they're already wrong from a scriptural right. perspective because they have failed to discern what Jesus has defined as the foundation of sexual ethics. Now, they're also probably telling me something else, that either they've already changed their mind about homosexual marriage, or they're headed very rapidly right. to doing so, and they just don't know it yet. Which has been so obvious in with Andy Stanley. I mean, not, I, I'm I'm sorry to say, somebody I've looked up to and appreciated his, you know, particularly advice on leadership and church. You know, like the way that you think about the church reaching out to community and people who aren't Christians. But now, unfortunately, like there are definite reports where he said, like he would he would marry his his granddaughters if 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 she was in a same sex relationship, and the Andy Stanley would not Andy Miller. Just want to make that clear. Uh, that's and right. Then, Two also, different Andys. That's right. And then the same thing is true. Like um where in another gathering people have verified that he said that he would, uh, um, that he's encouraged uh, people um, who are in a homosexual relationship to get married. So like these, these things are there. And sadly, this is something that we just have to work through on a regular basis. It, 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 you mentioned the idea of like, and the, and, and, analogy and making analogical arguments and corresponding to something. I think this comes back to, again, like the epistemological concern of rather or not truth corresponds with reality. Like, can right. we say that things indeed are true? And that's, that, that's the conflict, right? No, every interpretation, I mean, saying that every interpretation is the same is an interpretation. It's like the law of non-contradiction. That's right, exactly. I mean, it's an interpretation that when I put one foot after the other and walk, um, I think gravity is gonna keep me down. That's my interpretation. Right? right. I'm not going to fly up into the air or the, the, the ground isn't going to immediately swallow me up. Uh, this is my interpretation of things, but it's an interpretation that's based deeply in reality. Right. Yeah. And so some interpretations are based very strongly in the reality of the biblical text of the scriptural witness. Other interpretations, not so much or not at all. So that's the issue that we have to face. It's not all ambiguous. Yeah. And if we cannot recognize that a male-female requirement is the foundation for sexual ethics in Scripture, then I fear that such individuals have no understanding of Scripture across the board. Right. Because this is a pretty obvious one. And the right. only reason why we're changing up on that view is because of the forceful change of the culture, which right, makes right. us feel bad, makes us feel ostracized. They want to make us feel like bigots, closes off opportunities for us in the world. People hate us as a result of that. We don't want any of that. I don't want any of that. I'm not a masochist. But you can't rewrite scripture. You can't change the words of our Lord. You can't make it be something other than what it is. And when you, when a person attempts to um, cover in a stealth-like fashion parts of the biblical text and make what is obvious as all get out, be an agree to disagree matter, we got a serious problem. Yes. These are people that are. Now, that is a slippery slope. That is a sliding down the slope in rejecting the lordship of Jesus Christ. Any church, any denomination that embraces homosexual unions is a denomination or church that has ceased to be in any meaningful way a valid representation of Christ to the world. Wow. That's how basic it is. You cease to be a church of Jesus Christ. This is why Pannenberg and Thomas Oden, for instance, would say that this rises to a level of dogma. And Pannenberg uh, was quick to say that the United Church of Canada was no longer a part of the universal, the one holy apostolic universal church. Exactly. I mean, this is this is that. Uh, okay. 
I've, I've taken more time than I asked from you, but I've certainly appreciate every second. I'm going to ask, my question is this, that I close with everybody. My podcast is called more to the story. So I'd like to know if there's more to the story to Robert Gadden than is normally told. And while I give you a chance to think about that, I just am so thankful that, um, I had a chance. Some, some of my audience maybe had never heard of you. Now, I think that's a shame, but I am so glad that if this is the first time you've heard from Dr. Robert Gagnon, that you heard about him on my podcast. I'm honored by that because this is a voice and this is uh, that is needed in the life of the church, needed in the scholarly community, but also communicates with clarity and focus and prophetic intention and prophetic courage to our society. So I'm really glad that I've been able to introduce you to a few people today. So is there more to the story of Robert Gagnon? Is there something? <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Well, I, if I might also, <laughs> but enough about me, let's talk about my books. But, uh -huh. um, you know, I did want to put in a little bit of a- Oh, go, please because, do, please do. If it's okay, because I'm I'm working on a, uh, I've done a 500 page book on, on the Bible and homosexual practice. I've done a shorter two views book with a 50 page article, but there's somebody on the other side uh, called Homosexuality in the Bible, two views. I'm working on now this summer, hope to get it done by early fall, a shorter, um, 150, 200 pages for me that short, and <laughs> um, more an updated treatment on a biblical and compassionate view on homosexuality and transgenderism. Yeah. And uh, I intend this to be something you could give anybody into the pew, in the pews, yeah. to read, to look at. What does the Bible have to say about it? We'll also look a little bit about social scientific evidence, philosophical argumentation, and basically give a sort of small handbook to, to give to people and say, this is the book you need to read in order to find out what scripture has to say. There are some other books out there on the subject, and um, my objective is to try to write a better one. And give the sort of arguments that I've given in other places, but in a more bite-sized kind of fashion, the kind of thing that I would give if I gave, say, for example, uh, a weekend presentation on the Bible and homosexuality. Sure. Uh, this will be it. And I could just give that book. So Great. say to people, be looking for that to come out sometime around 2024. Right now, okay. I'm looking at prospective publishers, and it's going to be a hard book to publish because it's a very unpopular kind of book and it's yeah. subject matter. So if you want to, if you think you would buy such a book from me after hearing this podcast here today, then contact me. Uh, you contact me on Facebook. Okay. You could email me or contact me on Facebook. I have a, um, I have a pinned post right at the beginning okay. about this book project and simply like it or heart it or give a comment to yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. I will put you on a, I would just simply record here's another person to a prospective publisher who'd be willing to buy such a book. Hopefully buy the book will be on $25 or less for those who are worried about cost. because It'll be relatively short. So there's that. As far as me, what can I say? I'm just a guy who started off as a pagan. Actually, I started off as Roman Catholic, not as a okay. pagan. Started off as Roman Catholic. Um, I couldn't see the forest for the trees. I tried to date a young woman. At the end of high school, who happened to be a Christian, she happened to be Baptist, by the way, could have been a number of other denominations. The point is, she was just a believer. And long and short of it was, I began dating with her, began reading the Bible to impress her and her parents that I was a Christian. And in the course of reading the Gospels about Jesus, I turned my life over to Christ. Oh, awesome. Then I went to these schools like Dartmouth, Harvard Divinity School, Princeton Seminary, uh, and Despite the fact that they tried to turn me, they didn't turn me. Did I learn things? Yes, I learned things. But part of what I learned and part of what I think God did to prepare me for this work in sexual ethics is give me your best arguments. Yes. Give me your best shot about scripture, about anything about scripture, about God, about Christ, right? And I listened to them. I developed my own understanding. I was critical. They taught me to be critical. I was also critical about them. And at the end, they produced a product that hopefully God can use. I'm not intimidated by persons who aren't believers. I'm not intimidated by people who teach at elite institutions. I would be happy to debate a whole host of issues, not just in sexual ethics, but other issues with unbelievers. I don't care who you are. I don't care what place you teach at. doesn't make any difference to me. If I'm adopting a position that I can't defend, then why am I 
retaining the position. So I believe the positions that I hold, I hold them because they're the correct positions. I could yeah. be wrong on some things, but make your best argument. I look back at my past life and see how God has prepared me along the way to not just simply bend the knees to ball simply because the society has done it generally. Yeah. Okay. Be like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Be like Daniel. When the idol comes or whatever threat is being made, don't bend the knee. Trust God. Give the word of God in its undiluted form, which is what the whole apostolic witness is. Love people by sharing with them the truth. Yeah. In a yeah. loving way. So that's who I am. Plus, yeah. married this woman that I started dating back in high school. I'm married. I've been married since 1984. Two lovely daughters who love the Lord, for which I give God great thank. thanks. Am I perfect? As you well know, I am far from perfect. But God is not through with me yet. Amen. And I still love to serve the Lord. Yeah. And hope to do so to my dying last gasp. That's me in a nutshell. Oh, that is great. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. And thanks for coming on the podcast. It means a lot to me. I'm so happy to be in this podcast. Love the people at Wesley Biblical Seminary. It's a great institution. That's all I have to say. <laughs>